Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Chris Masterjohn of ChrisMasterjohnPhD.com, and you're listening to episode 67 of Mastering Nutrition, Ask Us Anything About Hormones, featuring my guest, Dr. Carrie Jones, which took place on May 10th, 2019, as an Ask Us Anything for members of the CMJ Masterpass. This is Mastering Nutrition with Chris Masterjohn. Take control of your health, master the science, and apply it like a pro. Are, 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 are you ready? In this episode, we have Dr. Kerry Jones as a guest. Kerry Jones is a naturopathic physician with a master's in public health, having over 12 years in the field of functional integrative medicine. She served as adjunct faculty for the National University of Natural Medicine, teaching courses in gynecology and advanced endocrinology. She has been the medical director for two large integrative clinics in Portland, Oregon, and is currently the medical director for Precision Analytical, the creators of the Dutch test. She frequently lectures, teaches, and writes on adrenal, thyroid, and sex hormones. You can find her at drcarryjones.com. And if you have Instagram, I would highly suggest following her on Instagram. Her handle is Dr. Carrie Jones with doctor spelled D R period. So it's D R period C A R R I E J O N E S, Dr. Carrie Jones. She puts out a lot of good content educating people on hormonal health over on Instagram there. So some of the questions that come up in this Ask Us Anything, which came to uh, to Dr. Jones and me, um, I gave her most of the limelight, but I, I pop in with my own opinions fairly frequently. Uh, some questions that came up were, what time of day is best to take T4 or T3? Questions about using pregnenolone to manage perimenopausal symptoms such as insomnia. A 30-year-old male with normal total testosterone but high sex hormone binding globulin and low free testosterone, suffering from sexual dysfunction, low libido, trouble packing on lean muscle, poor mood, and low motivation, what should he do? What to do when even small amounts of iodine cause fatigue? A woman who had a surgical procedure to prevent cervical cancer lost sexual sensation, libido, and the ability to have a cervical orgasm and began experiencing nerve pain in her pelvic muscles and legs whenever putting pressure on the cervix. She asks, can sex damage the healing nerves and can progesterone or vitamin E help and are they safe? And of course, what else can she do? A man who had been on testosterone replacement therapy for five years and then stopped it for five years now has low testosterone and low libido but good muscle strength. Should he go back on the testosterone? Another person asks, what nutrients are needed to make hormones? Another asks, what causes waking up too early and why does it seem to correlate with depression? What causes night sweats in men? Nutrition for breast cancer prevention. Why would a woman stop ovulating during her cycle or stop having a cycle altogether? Can anything be done to reverse hypothyroidism other than taking thyroid meds? Should Hashimoto's be treated with iodine restriction? What kinds of hormonal problems, if any, could be caused by a ketogenic diet? Is there an optimal number of meals per day to take advantage of the positive effects that insulin has on thyroid function? And should a 69-year-old female avoid taking testosterone if she's starting to lose her hair? Get the answers to these questions and discussions surrounding them by listening on for the full episode. First, a word from my sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes, I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal 
from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. Vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. 
For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. All right. A um, few people are popping in now. Uh, can I, can everyone hear me good? Is my volume good? If if not, type something in the chat. Um, and then let's see. Is is Carrie here yet? Uh, okay. Carrie just came in. Cool. Um, all right. Yeah. So. Hi, Dr. Jones. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I, I gave everyone your intro uh, or your bio in the description, and then when we release the recording, I'll put it in again. And so I'll just assume everyone knows who you are. Uh, but real quickly, I asked Dr. Carrie Jones to come on and talk about hormones because uh, she is the medical director for Precision Analytical, which makes the Dutch hormone test, uh, which is a very uh, complete look at metabolites of hormones that gives you incredible insight into what's actually going on and like why something might be high or low instead of just whether something's high or low. And so she studies this stuff all the time and I thought it'd be cool to have uh, her field some questions. And she, if you don't follow her on Instagram and you're on Instagram, make sure you follow her on Instagram because she talks about hormones over there all the time. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for coming on. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for having me. You like my, uh, I feel like I'm I, my gaming headset here. Ah, it's awesome. Actually, I should probably have, um, does anyone hear any echo or feedback from me? I'm going to put my earphones in just in, mm -mm. Just in case. Usually uh, I use my um, Apple, you know, my little white Apple things. And then the right head, the right side just busted. It stopped working. So I had to uh, res resort to my like formal headset. So I'm so sad. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. cool. My, my volume hasn't changed, does it? Uh -uh. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So uh, for those of you um, who have not been in one of these things before, the way this is going to work is please do not use the chat for almost everything. So if you want to type a question, type it in the Q&A section. If you want to respond to a question that is being um, that was entered into the Q&A section, do so by replying to the Q&A. And actually, I'm just realizing now I need to... Um, I think I need to adjust something on the settings. Let me see. Oh, here it is. Um, okay, so I just changed the settings so that you can comment on other people's questions. So if you want to jump in on a conversation for a question that is coming through the Q&A, uh, the proper place to do that is to reply there. Um, but one thing that we'll use the chat for is if someone wants to come on the screen and ask their question live, they can raise their hand and I'll call on them and let you in. And then the only way that you can jump in on someone else's question is to use the chat. So the chat will be used exclusively for that. Um, and then I, I guess, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll more or less act as the moderator and go through the questions. <laughs> I think we have enough to get to everyone. So I'll just mostly handle them in order. And then um, Carrie, I'll field the questions to, to you first most of the time. And then if I want to if I feel like I have something to say, I'll, I'll jump in on it. Sound good? Oh, I hope you have something to say. Yeah, I like I when you have something to say. <laughs> something to say so. <laughs> All right. So um, the first question is, um, and I'm, I'm going to, if there are multiple people posting as anonymous, I'm sorry, but I'm going to treat anonymous as a person. Otherwise, I can't make sure that everyone gets, in, gets their questions in. So I'm just going to rotate through like one question each person and come back. Okay. So anonymous says, can you give any guidance on what time of day it is best to take T4 and or T3. Carrie, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, that's a good, really good question. And it actually depends if you're taking um, immediate release T4 or T3 especially, or sustained release, because T4 has a much longer half-life, which is why we traditionally say to take it in the morning since it helps with energy and metabolism and all those things. Although I do know some people choose to take their T4 at night before bed. Um, but T3 has a very short half-life. And so what I'm finding is of some practitioners are now doing what's called a sustained release T3. So they take mm. their T3 and it helps sustain longer throughout the day, or they will take their T3 twice. They'll take it 
in the morning and then it'll sort of take it again um, in the mid-afternoon. Now, if you're taking a combination T4, T3, such as um, Armor or Nature Throid, you can't get the um, st- sustained part. So then I do know some people who will take their Armor or their Nature Throid in the morning and then they will take an additional dose of T3 uh, in the early afternoon, like an extra, you know, whatever it is, two and a half, five micrograms of T3. I think, I think the old school way to get the time release was to nibble on a Cytomel tablet all day. Literally. That's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly what people would do. Um, yeah, I, I know, I don't know anything about this and I, but I know that some people, uh, you think that circadian rhythm is an important thing in timing of thyroid hormone. Do you know anything mm-hmm. about that? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that more and more just because of the clock gene and things like that, um, which is why I'm hearing, um, it's not formally being prescribed this way, but when you read, read chat boards and stuff like this, people are actually switching their thyroid to the nighttime um, to see if they get a different response than how they feel in the day, um, and I'm, which I think is it was pretty interesting. And by, and I mean, their T that it's their T4, not their T3. I, mm. I don't know that I would take T3 before bed and probably wire you right up, but um, I have had some folks switch their T4 to the evening time um, just for then, you know, when they sleep their T4, because it has a ha- long half-life, it's already in their system and, and, you know, been working while they've been asleep. Um, but traditional is you take it in the day because that's when the thyroid is active and doing its things. And that's when you want it active. Okay, cool. Well, that's when you want the activity of the hormone, I should say. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Mindy Cabrera says, I'm looking for an informed opinion on the use of pregnenolone to manage perimenopausal symptoms, particularly insomnia, which I get early in my cycle and mid cycle. It seems to help, but I don't feel confident in using it. Anything else would be better. Anything else that would be better for GNRH induced insomnia? Well, so here's the thing about pregnenolone. So um, oral or uh, sublingual. So if you've got drops or little tablets you suck on pregnenolone and progesterone, when they uh, go through first pass, you swallow them and then go through first pass, they turn into other metabolites. One is called allo, A-L-L-O, which is short for allopregnanolone. Allo binds to your GABA receptors in your brain. Allo can cross the blood-brain barrier, binds to GABA. GABA, of course, is your calming, relaxing, everything's going to be okay hormone. So um, pregnanolone, oral pregnanolone and oral progesterone actually work on the anxiety and on the insomnia from a GABA Mm point of view, um, is, which is, is why that, um, if, if it's not oral, do you know, if, how, like, is there uh, normally endogenous allo pregnenolone? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Have receptors? yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. Your body makes it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's, it, it gets, it, it's a neurosteroid. So your brain makes it. And then the breakdown of progesterone can t- turn into allo and that can cro- cross the blood brain barrier. So you make, you make it yourself in right. the brain, but it is women with, especially if you are headed into perimenopause, you're not ovulating. You're not getting that robust progesterone peak in the luteal phase. It falls it, close to your period, and now in the early part of your follicular phase, then it, it you're hurting because you've missed out. You didn't get any of that sustained progesterone release that turned into allo, and insomnia is really common around the cycle and really common in perimenopause, right? I would say, other than weight gain, I would say insomnia is probably the other big symptom I hear for perimenopause. And that's do a big you, one. Carrie, do you find that... Um that the insomnia is different between people who are, are, aren't on HRT? Um, yes, sort of. So if it's strictly a hormone issue, if she says, I've never had insomnia, I turned 45 and I got insomnia. And oh, by the way, I'm also having irregular periods and hot flashes and night sweats and all this stuff. Um, I find that going on HRT generally resolves their insomnia. If they've had insomnia their whole life and oh, by the way, they're having hormonal issues as well or they're perimenopausal, going on HRT may or may not help their insomnia because their insomnia may be induced by, of course, other things, cortisol, blood sugar, parasites, you know, thyroid, hypothyroidism, you know, hyperthyroidism. Um, And so then I find that it's much more systemic as opposed to just the women who say to me, I turn 40 and can't sleep or I turn 45 and I can't sleep. I'm like, oh, Perimenopause. Yeah, I'm curious mainly because it seems like in some women, uh, estrogen can be a cause of insomnia. So we had talked about one of my clients a while back who had estrogen through the roof mm-hmm. for unknown, re- unknown reasons, and insomnia was a major thing that she was dealing with. I um, could believe it. Yeah. I could. 
I could believe it. Yeah. I'm a big fan of estrogen, but it's, it's like Goldilocks, right? Like too little is a yeah. problem and too, too much yeah. is a problem. But if you think about it too, um, like high estrogen pushes tryptophan down the kynurenine pathway yeah. and away from serotonin and melatonin. So if you have excessively high amounts of estrogen, you're going to likely make a little bit less serotonin and melatonin and that can really affect your mood and then it'll affect your melatonin so your sleep. Yeah, I was um, I was looking at a paper on this recently and it looks like even though estrogen stimulates the beginning of the kynurenine pathway, it stimulates the end of it a lot more. Mm. And so you can, uh, in addition to not getting melatonin, and serotonin, um, you can get quinolinate, which can oh, be excitotoxic yeah. or, or an excitatory yeah. neurotransmitter building yeah. up. And um, my... I, I, have you have you put any thought into why that happens? Because my thought right now is that um, is that it that that pathway is how you make niacin from tryptophan, mm-hmm. and so I, I think that it's basically the body trying to make sure that the baby has enough niacin because chronic estrogen exposure would occur during pregnancy, right? And, um, and so one, one thing that I've, the, when I was doing my niacin research, one thing that I found is that women, um, women seem to need more total niacin than men, but they oh, yeah. seem to be better at making niacin from protein. And what's really interesting is that the studies that were done that were used to make the RDA, they weren't comparisons of men and women, but two of the studies were in men and two studies were in women. Mm. And the standard deviations, meaning how much variation there was person to person in how much niacin that they needed to normalize what they were looking at Mm -hmm. um, was way bigger in men than it was in women. And so one of the interesting things is that it seems like, and that is not. This is not a strong conclusion, but it's a. It's a. It's one worth talking about. It seems like, in men, the ability to make niacin from tryptophan is not regulated at all, mm-hmm. and it's largely because if you have too much tryptophan, you need to get rid of it down that pathway, mm-hmm. and if your ability to completely burn it for energy is topped off then quinolinate, which is neurotoxic, will build up unless you convert it to niacin. Same with kynurenic, right? And xanthiernic. Yeah, well, yeah, everything that goes into that, Mm -hmm. like once you start going down that pathway, um, you can build, uh, well, yeah, like if you had a backup in that, so kynurenic and xanthiernic are spilling off from higher up parts of the pathway. Right, that's true. If you have a block block in one of those parts, um, then if you have, too much tryptophan coming in, they will build up. Right. But if the block is not in those parts and tryptophan goes down, what it's ultimately doing is it's going to be completely Quinn. burned for energy or it's going to go into quinolinate, which is neurotoxic, mm-hmm. and then into, uh, into niacin. And so in men, imagine that most of that pathway is working fine. So you're not getting buildup of xanthorinate and kynorinate. Mm-hmm. If you get down to completely burn the tryptophan for, en- for energy and suddenly your capacity to do that is blocked up, then at the very end of the pathway is where you have the quinolinate, which is a, a potential neurotoxic risk. It's mm-hmm. not that quinolinate is poisonous. It's like glutamate, like too much is bad. Right. And, so, and so niacin there is a way, making niacin from quinolinate is a way of making sure that you don't have neurotoxic levels of quinolinate building up. So it's like a safety valve. But, but estrogen dramatically increases this pathway and it increases the steps at the end that generate quinolinate even more than it increases the beginning of the pathway. And as a result, women have much better ability on average than men to make uh, niacin, niacin from tryptophan, but also they seem to have a much more consistent ability. In other words, in men, it, there's no regulation to it at all. And so huh. one man versus another man is really, really random. Whereas for women, there's variation, but it's, it's in a much tighter range. And that, that variation is pr- like probably if you accounted for their estrogen levels, mm-hmm. probably that, that would really narrow the range down. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really, really tightly regulated by estrogen. Um, but, but, you know, if your estrogen levels are really, really high, and they're consistently high, and you're not pregnant, and you're not using the niacin for the baby, 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and you're just exceeding the capacity to deal with that quinolinate. It seems like that's the condition where you have, um, where you, where you have uh, the potential for that quinolinate building up as right. a result of estrogen that's going to do dirty, nasty things in the brain that it shouldn't be doing. Well, and think about the men too, who are on, who over aromatize, um, I like, or, you know, maybe they're on on, on unregulated testosterone and by unregulated, I mean, um, they're just on testosterone, you know, they're just, their doctor just ran a testosterone, just gave them testosterone. Maybe it's an injection. It's high dose. Here you go. And all of a sudden they're like, I feel like I felt good initially. And now I feel worse. I brain fog, right. I'm moody. I have this breast development. What's going on. It's like, well, you're just aromatizing it all to estrogen. And then if you have that same pathway, Right. Yeah, that's a really great point. In fact, in one of these AMAs uh, a, few, a couple months ago, one of the first ones I did, uh, there was a man who was asking why his B6 deficiency markers were so high. And the oh. B6 deficiency markers in the urine are the things we're talking about right here that spill out yep. of the pathway. Yep. And I was asking him a few different questions, maybe you're eating too much protein, this and that. And then I mentioned something about estrogen regulating it. And he said, oh, by the way, my estrogen is really high. <laughs> And I was like, oh, wow. I, you know, I was yeah, like, I was, I was um, inappropriately excluding that because of the sex issue. But yeah, estrogen is not a, not a, just a female thing. Uh, For all, sure. Obviously. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And then that whole cycle just keeps going round and round. Cause the, the one marker, the xanthiranate, which is a B6 dependent, um, it'll complex with insulin and then it'll make somebody have higher glucose right now they're on the track to developing insulin resistance and diabetes which further increases estrogen especially in men and and then now you're back on the same circle Mm. all right um let's go to brendan hannigan brendan hannigan is a 30 year old male with high shbg and low free testosterone total (laughs) testosterone is normal 700 nanograms per deciliter higher but shbg ranges from 50 to 80 nanomoles per liter as a result Free testosterone sits at the bottom of the range and sometimes below it. Symptoms of poor testosterone status, sexual dysfunction, low libido, trouble building muscle mass without gaining a lot of fat, low mood, and motivation. Background, this is a whole question, background. Hypothyroidism that's currently well-managed, but treat T4 and T3. No major weight issues, no sign of metabolic dysfunction or liver problems. Very low progesterone and high estrogen due to, another case, high estrogen in men, due Mm -hmm. to progesterone... um, very low progesterone and high estrogen to progesterone ratio, mm. but absolute estradiol levels are below range. Okay, not another case of that then. Okay. Normal prolactin, yeah. DHEA, LH, FSH, et cetera. Very low blood lipids, TC, total cholesterol around 100 to 140, pretty low. Wow. Things that, things that didn't work, over-the-counter supplements to lower SHBG and increase free T, <laughs> boron, zinc, various herbs like Tomcat, Ali, yep. et cetera, and even a course of Sir Morlin, an injectable yep. GH secretog, raising total cholesterol to 160 to 170 through cholesterol supplementation. Looking for ideas. What am I missing? Any, <laughs> I uh, have no on idea. <laughs> Unfortunately, SHBG is like the ba- the bane of my existence. I have no idea how to get SHBG down once it's up. And uh, boy, I sure talk to practitioners about this all the time to 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 figure that out. Um, I would agree that supplements that for SHBG, it's very hit or miss. Tomcat being one of them, DHEA being the other. Um, what's the, uh, um, there's two other ones. Um, nettles, stingy nettles. Oh, and Avena oats. Um, there's like very mild, very weak research about lowering SHBG with nettles and then with Avena. Um, again, it's like hit or miss. So how to get that SHBG down? Well, also remember, SHBG binds estrogen as well. Although he said his estrogen's low, his actually total low. Estradiol, relative. Yeah, his yeah. absolute estradiol is low. So it's not his SHBG is not going up because of a low absolute estradiol. Hmm. And low progesterone gives men the same symptoms as low testosterone. I don't actually worry that that much about progesterone because as the other things improve. Generally, progesterone improves as well. Generally, yeah. This. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm curious how an increase in body fat might affect this because, um, did he say? No, no. He said he had oh, no he weight has. problems. He said, okay. He said no major weight issues, no sign of metabolic dysfunction or liver problems. Okay. Um. So I, I don't know. Like it's it seems to me logically that a high SHBG is a bad thing, and that seems supported by his symptoms. Um. But if you look at the literature, 
uh, high SHBG seems like um, SHBG goes down with an increase in liver fat mm-hmm. and, and insulin. And, and it seems, and it seems like a high SHBG is correlated with a lower disease risk for a variety of things. And, um, so I, I think sometimes it might be counterintuitive, but something like maybe you need to weigh a little bit more, um, yeah. sometimes is an, is an issue there. Um, even though that's, that's not a good answer if the person is not underweight, but, um, I've heard from some other, I'm not an expert in this at all, but I have heard from some other practitioners. Um, mycotoxin will raise SHBG. Hmm. Um, mycotoxin does. And what was the other one that does? But I, I have not done any of the research into that. Um, I've just had a few yeah. you know, mycotoxin experts say, see it all the time. When we address their mycotoxin, uh, their SHBG goes back to normal. I'm like, well, that would make sense, right? All your binding globulins are going to go up. Yeah, to, just, interesting. To, to bind and protect or try to protect. So uh, you may, Brandon, want to look into other things, viruses, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, you know, mm. mycotoxin, just things like that. Run some inflammatory markers, see what's up and just see if you're missing. You're looking at the hormones, but maybe you've run a lot of great stuff, but maybe it's just the next layer down in the onion. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that his cholesterol still isn't very high. That's not good. 100 to 140? Um, yeah, I mean, he got it. So he says he used cholesterol supplementation to get it up to 160 to 170. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wonder that if that's kind- familial. Like, you know, does everyone in his family have low cholesterol or is it just him? Yeah, Bre- Brendan, if you're able to comment <laughs> on that, um, that, that, would be an, that would be an interesting question to answer whether, whether your family members... Um, have those issues or have the cholesterol issues specifically. I mean, so my thought is, um, and, and you know, when I was a vegan, my cholesterol was 106, my total cholesterol. Uh, but I was also like borderline psychotic when I was a vegan. And so, um, I don't, I don't think it was a good thing, but my, even, even on a high animal fat diet, my cholesterol is around 160 or so. Um, in fact, although it might be higher now, I haven't checked it in a while. Oh, Brendan um, answered. Oh, dad and grandpa have low total cholesterol too, but not as extreme. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I don't think you should completely exclude that you might want to raise your cholesterol higher than that. I mean, I know, I know 160 and 170 would be looked at as really, really good from a, uh, you know, from a, a cardiovascular person's perspective, like your cardiologist isn't going to tell you you need it higher, but, um, but you know, cholesterol is is a precursor to the sex hormones, and is going to be uh, in is going to be a uh, a factor in your body's perception of how much abundance you have. And right. the fact that you needed cholesterol supplements to bring it up to one hundred and sixty to one hundred and seventy makes me think that. Your, your, the general state of cholesterol in your body is is very very low by default mm-hmm. and is still pretty low, and um, I you know I, I don't know like what one one seventy should be okay, but I think given the specific problems that you're looking at, pushing it up to two hundred and seeing if you feel any better is should be like one of the tools in the kit. Is my thought. It's- it's interesting that some of his hormones are low and some are high. Like his total testosterone is high or in range. I apologize. Yeah. In range. So he can make testosterone, right? He has the testicular ability to pull in cholesterol and make it. But his progesterone and estrogen aren't absolutely high. So those two are low. Yeah. But testosterone yeah, okay. His, no, his, his free is low, but we know that's bound up. So. Well, we don't know what the cholesterol content of his liver is, but mm. but the liver lipids. I mean, obviously, you don't want fatty liver, but uh, but there there might be a threshold where like the cholesterol content in the liver and the triglyceride content in the liver are influencing the SHBG expression. Mm-hmm. Um, so my thought is, uh, yeah, it's it clearly it's not like the the limiting precursor to the production of sex hormones, but it might be the thing. It's just like, no one's going to give them a liver biopsy. (laughs) But it's a, it's a reasonable thought that it, that it might be influencing the SHBG expression. Um, So yeah, I mean, neither of us have good answers, but there's some, so 
All right. Thanks, Brendan. Okay. Um, Eric Hushbeck says, always mild fatigue reaction to even 100 micrograms of iodine, despite low thyroid peroxidase and TPA. What's TPA antibodies? Do you know? I, TPO and TP. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I thought um, it was TG, thyroglobulin. Yeah, maybe that's what he Antibody. Um, and 24-hour urine, uh, urinary iodine is 53 micrograms, which is moderately deficient. So, okay. So he, he doesn't look like he has thyroiditis. He looks deficient in iodine. Small doses of iodine are giving him fatigue. Any thoughts? Yes. Well, one thought is a big one. So remember, iodine belongs to the halogen family and other halogens can bind onto your, the T, your tyrosine. Um, so I have had this before where patients uh, would take iodine and the iodine will push off, you know, the fluoride and the chloride and the bromide off of the, thi the tyrosine. And then they, it, so it binds on. And now you have with essentially kind of a detox reaction. So people will say, I get headaches. I've broken out in rashes. I'm really tired because the hal other halogens have come off the tyrosine and um, are now floating around your system. And so um, whenever I don't actually, I, I'm, I believe in iodine. Um, I'm not quite sure I, Fully, I'm not. I'm not sold yet on iodine testing. There, I feel like there's so many rules of thoughts. Um, but if I use iodine, I warn people of that of of the detox you, reaction. You mean you're not happen. you're not sure how valuable a 24 hour urinary iodine is? is that yeah, I don't use it. I don't. I don't. If I'm going to spend money on a patient, it's not normally on a 24 hour iodine yeah. test. My 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 perception has been that the 24 hour urinary iodine is a good marker of what you've been eating in the last day or so. Mm -hmm. And if you, you could, so the thing, I think where it would be valuable is um, if you don't know the iodine content of your diet, which mm -hmm. is uh, almost guaranteed that you have no idea how much iodine you're eating because <laughs> like uh, it depends. Like if you're, if most of your iodine is coming from kelp, you probably have a reasonably good idea of how much iodine you're getting, but on a diet where most of your iodine is coming from land foods, mm -hmm. then you have absolutely no idea because, um, well, you can get a general idea. Like if you're living in, in like the, an iodine deficient belt in Illinois and everything that you eat comes from the local farmer's market, you probably have low iodine intake, but like a, a potato from one part of the United States can have a hundred times as much iodine as a potato from another part of the United States. So I think if you eat very consistently, if you eat the same thing every day, um, a 24, one 24 hour iodine is probably a pretty good reflection of the iodine content of your diet. Um, and if for most people, probably three or four 24 hour urinary iodines spread out across in a way that would capture mm -hmm. a representative sample of what they're usually eating would probably give you a pretty good idea of the intake. It just does, it doesn't really tell you your status though, because you know what's your exposure to the other halogens and 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 things like that. Um, but so I yeah, but you're probably right. It's it's probably not the top priority in spending money unless <laughs> you unless you have reasons to think your issue is yeah. iodine related. Yeah. And, in this case, he's got yep. fatigue reactions to iodine. So it's, I guess it's interesting what that is urinary iodine looks like he needs more. And, and I mean, his urinary iodine isn't real high, right? So he doesn't have iodine toxicity. No, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so in those, I, have you found in those cases where people say, or, or where people report these detox reactions to iodine, have you found a solution to this? Is the solution just to keep taking the iodine power through yep. it? Yep. And, and doing like, you know, sweating and, and binders and, and things like that, doing all the normal stuff you would do for a Herxheimer type reaction, oh, but it can take one to two no, weeks. Wait a second. What's all the normal things you do for a Herxheimer reaction? Oh, well, <laughs> wait a minute. So obviously like lots of water exercise, you know, binders. So like fiber and charcoal or zeolite or, or whatever you're doing to like bind this stuff up in your clay, you know, those supplements with that sort of stuff in it. Um, saunas are really good sweating, um, dry skin brushing to try to help move it through your body while staying on the iodine. Cause you want the iodine to bind the tyrosine and not the halogen to rebind because you've stopped taking it. So it's just going to rebind, rebind to your tyrosine. And I've seen it take 
you know, a co- up to a couple weeks, depending how halogen uh, toxic that you are. In fact, I had a bus driver um, as a patient who drank eight diet, or no, eight um, Mountain Dews a day because every, she had a, her shift, she had four, long, you know, going this way and then four coming back to the station was the consistency of her day. And with every long drive she did, she drank a Mountain Dew. So eight Mountain Dews a day. So her, first of all, just to get her off Mountain Dew was, um, you know, a struggle. And then, and then her reaction was we worked with thyroid and thyroid was a big thing for her detox iodine lifestyle. Um, her reaction was a long time because she'd been drinking eight Mountain Dews for a long time as a bus what's, driver. What's in the Mountain Dew you're trying to detox? It's, oh, sorry, bromide. Yellow Mountain color? Dew is oh, there's bromide in it. Bromide. It's very yeah. high in bromide. Um, yeah. And so I was trying to get the bromide out of her system. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of Mountain Dew. Eight, um, yes. Yeah. I, uh, I always avoided it because of the rumor on the street when I was a teenager was that it would make your testicles shrink. And I don't know if that's true. But <laughs> I don't know if that's true either. That was, uh, that was yeah. the urban legend that I... Oh, that's hilarious. To, so. I always heard that it had the most caffeine. I never, I never, yeah. Mountain Dew, I never got into Mountain Dew ever. I don't even like the taste, but um, I, my friends are always who drank it were always like, well, it has the most caffeine content. <laughs> like, well, that's Not as, uh, not as much as some of the things out there now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This was years ago when I was much younger. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Eric, for your question. Gary Krieger says, would a seasonally low vitamin D level, he lives in Northern Michigan, combined with a high calcium intake, 1,500, 2,000, I, he must mean milligrams, um, 500 milligrams from supplements, so 1,000 to 1,500 from diet, 500 milligrams from supplements. Would this increase the risk for soft tissue calcification and vitamin A, K2, magnesium levels were adequate, or would the calcium simply be excreted due to low vitamin D levels? Uh, I'll take the first step. I was like, one. that's a better question yeah, for you, Chris. This is a, I think this is, <laughs> this is a Chris question. <laughs> um, okay, so with a seasonally low vitamin D level, despite high calcium, would that increase, would, would that, I'm not, uh, Gary, if you can follow up, uh, I'm not sure if you're asking, would the low vitamin D level increase the soft tissue calcification or would the calci- the high calcium do so? Um, or both, you could answer either way. Yeah, okay. So, so the end of this question is, would the calcium simply be excreted due to the low vitamin D levels? So your vitamin D level being low um, the first thing that's going to do, and the, the major thing that's going to do, is it's going to lower your calcium absorption. And so you would have more calcium excreted in the feces as a result of not absorbing it if your vitamin D level is low. However, a high enough calcium intake is going to more than compensate for that. So it depends how low it is. I mean, if you if you live in northern Michigan and you're not supplementing with vitamin D in the winter, but you're getting out, you're outdoors a lot, your vitamin D is probably not going like rickets level low. <laughs> uh, it's you know it's probably dipping a bit, and a, cal- a calcium intake of two thousand milligrams is so high that you're probably absorbing at least enough calcium, and the vitamin D being low. Um, the so the main the, the like then once the calcium is in your system one of the problems with low vitamin D is that um, it's going to take more calcium to suppress your parathyroid hormone and you want your parathyroid hormone maximally suppressed for the sake of your bone health uh, but again a high calcium intake like that may well completely compensate for that now the soft tissue calcification is going to be driven by on the one side, so you could view it as like a calcium in, calcium, calcium in, calcium out. You could view it as a pro-calcification, anti-calcification equation. And so the calcium phosphate product, which is the, um, the concentration of calcium in your blood times the concentration of phosphorus in your blood is going to be the pro-calcification side of that equation. And the protective factors that are like the proteins that are made by A, D, and activated by K2, the magnesium, and a couple other things are going to be defending the soft tissues against calcification. And so um, the the low vitamin D is probably not going to change your calcium phosphate product that much. 
the calcium intake, I mean, 2000 milligrams, I think is pushing the safe limit of calcium. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily harmful, but it's, it's, uh, calcium doesn't have a huge window. I think 1000 to 2000 milligrams is probably the safe window for calcium. Um, and so, yeah, um, it depends how low the vitamin D levels are. So like if it's going down to 20 or 25 nanograms per milliliter, it's probably not going to interfere that much with the ability of the other things to defend you against soft tissue calcification, but below that it might. And if it's dipping from like 60 to 40 nanograms per milliliter, it's probably just that, you know, vitamin D has a U-shaped curve with calcification. So you don't want to be deficient, but when you get up into 50, 60 nanograms per milliliter, you're you're not asking the question of whether you need more vitamin D to protect against soft tissue calcification. You're asking whether you might have too much. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it's going down to 30, um, no issue at all. If it's going down to like 20 or 25, you might, you might want to take a, you might want to measure your vitamin D levels, your parathyroid hormone levels, and use a little bit of extra vitamin D if you need to, to normalize those levels. Um, you know, bring 25 OHD up to 30 ish or a, a little higher, uh, bring PTH to 30 ish or lower. And, um, yeah, that's, that's my thought. Do you have anything to add, Carrie? Nope. Okay. I like it. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so let me, let me, I just have to, I'm, I'm copying and pasting these questions into a list. And because I was answering that one, I forgot to do it. So, um, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for your question. Jillian Harkey says, I had a LEAP procedure, L-E-E-P, 5.5 months ago mm -hmm. at three weeks post-op and since. I've lost, uh, Carrie, what's, what is a L-E-E-P? What is that? It's a, a procedure there where they remove the surface part of the cervix. Oh, um, okay. and, uh, for you what know, purpose? Um, usually it's for lesions, so precancerous lesions or for, um, yeah, okay. or cancer itself. Thanks. I had a, I had a leap procedure 5.5 months ago at three weeks post-op and since I've lost sexual sensation and libido can no longer barely have cervical orgasms and experience nerve pain in my pelvic muscles and legs. If I put pressure on the cervix, could progesterone and vitamin E oil applied directly to the cervix help reverse any possible post-surgical fibrosis? If progesterone is progesterone safe to take to see if it helps with libido. And then she follows up also could sex and orgasms I can still have a clitoral vaginal orgasm if I really concentrate, have damaged healing nerves. Could, uh, could sex and orgasms have damaged healing nerves? I guess she's asking, could too much clitoral and vaginal orgasms damage the nerves in that context? Or could my own bodily environment have- Probably been not. I mean- let me just finish those two sentences left. Or could my okay. own bodily environment have been a perfect storm for poor healing? I don't know what is due to nerve damage, what is due to hormones. I don't know what is happening to me. Any thoughts? So yeah, with the LEAP procedure, so like I was saying is basically it's kind of like a hot knife through butter. So they 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 cut away a portion of the cervix and, and it depends. Sometimes it's a little portion and sometimes they do what they call like a, um, a full, like, like slide it right across the the. Uh, the face of the cervix. And if you remember, for those of you who maybe have never seen a cervix, it's shaped like a donut. Like literally it's like your cervix is this tiny little pink donut and has a hole in the middle and the hole is, you know, leads up into your uterus. And so um, for a lot of women, they, there's a lot of nerve um, uh, sensation there. So it does greatly affect orgasms. Other women don't have it. There's probably women listening who were like, Mine's not sensitive at all. Is that normal? Yep, totally normal. Every woman is different. So for her though, in particular, she did have a lot of nerve sensation um, there on the cervix. So first of all, progesterone is a hormone. Never just take a hormone because you heard it's good and, and want to try it. Definitely, you know, at least talk with your practitioner, get your progesterone levels checked in, in the second half of your cycle, the luteal phase and C. And if then, yes, you need progesterone, then yes, girl, try it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and you and can try it directly applying it to the cervix. You can, you can do progesterone vaginally. Yes. Um, now it's not, you would have to have it compounded, um, or, uh, to, because you, the, 
topical creams on the market are not meant to be vaginal. They're meant to be on the outside of the skin, not the inside. So be very careful of that. You want it compounded specifically for vaginal um, application. Um, there are a few over the counter or there's one, um, I don't actually, I don't think they're over the counter. There's a company called Bezwecken and they have, theirs is made in coconut oil and, and vitamin E oil. So it is safe for vaginal purposes, but you still have to be a practitioner to, um, to get access to it. Um, but yes, then you can use progesterone and you can absolutely use vitamin E capsules. You can break the capsule and insert it up there vaginally to try to help. Now, I will say the other thing that I found really, really helpful for things like that acupuncture, believe it or not, um, pelvic abdominal type acupuncture is really helpful. And there's specific, um, um, like abdominal pelvic massage. So just like you have physical therapy for your shoulder or your knee, there's, there are physical therapists who do, uh, who are specially trained in certain kind of massages to focus in and around the uterus and the, you know, the, it's all, it's usually all external. Um, and so there's two, two, kind of bigger groups. One is called Arvigo, starts with an A, Arvigo. Um, so you can look on their website, Arvigo Massage, see, find the massage therapist and physical therapist who are trained. The other is the Mercier uh, therapy, which is uh, M-E-R-C-I-E-R. So to us, it'd be Mercier, <laughs> but it's Mercier <laughs> therapy. Um, and, and what it does is More it Mercier helps- More Mercier than uh, most other places. Exactly, there. exactly. So it helps with like nerves and congestion and, and muscular support in and around sort of that whole um, pelvic area. But yeah, you can absolutely, um, it, it, and keep in mind, you just had surgery. So, and it takes a really long time for nerves to grow back. I think they grow, like the research shows they grow back with like a millimeter a month. And so if you, you just had that, those nerves scraped away or the ends scraped off, it's going to take months to, mm. to reconcile that. It's, it's nerves are that um, sounds hopeful. not fast growing, but it is definitely possible. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Vitamin, thank you. Yeah. Vitamin E is a good one. Thank you, Jillian, for your question. Uh, Anders Strom says, I have been on testosterone replacement therapy for five years and stopped five years ago. My total T is very low between 100 in the AM and 45 in the PM. I have been oh. off. I've been off. Uh, doesn't put the units. That's very low if it's uh, what I'm familiar with. Um, yes or not. I have been off from two years now. Um, Anders, if you if you're uh, if you're replying, could you put the units in for the testosterone? I've been off for two years now. How long should I wait it out? Bef oh, his results are nanograms per milliliter apparently because his free T is one point four nanograms per milliliter. Good gracious! Um, I've been off for two years now. How long should I wait it out before giving up and going back? I feel good, but there are risks with prolonged low T. My free T is 1.4 nanograms per milliliter and 55, but have good muscle strength and mass. And I'm not putting on weight, but libido is pretty low. Well, first of all, I would want to find out why you aren't making testosterone. So I would definitely have your practitioner run an LH on you, luteinizing hormone. The total is nanograms per deciliter. Okay. Um, so men have luteinizing hormone, just like women do, comes from the brain and it's what stimulates the testes to make testosterone. So Anders, if you have low LH, then I know it's a brain problem, not necessarily a testicular problem. And if your LH is normal, if it's in the he range- says LH and FSH are good. How about prolactin? How about prolactin, Anders? Thyroid? Thyroid? Heavy metals? Like lead? Metal. Lead concentrates in the testicular tissue? I'll just throw in my uh, my stuff here. So um, so MK4 the, is a form of vitamin K2 that in the testicles through reg, it increases the gene expression involved in testosterone synthesis. And uh, osteocalcin is a vitamin K2 dependent protein that is kept in the bone and released during bone resorption that stimulates testosterone production in the male testes. Um, so you can actually measure under carboxylated osteocalcin in the blood through hmm. either Quest or Gen I think it's Genova that has the under carboxylated version. Um, but that would be worthwhile. And yeah. I'd put vitamin K in one of the list of things that you could look into. 
For sure. He says, right? uh, prolactin is good. Thyroid is good. Hmm. Definitely check vitamin K. Vitamin K, heavy metals, anything yep. else on the list? Well, I was going to say, his See? question was, how long do I wait till I throw in the towel? Oh, but, yeah. Um, and, um, and the other thing, you know, how how old is he? Does he have a history 55. of... Oh, 55. I missed that yeah. part. Okay. Okay. I'm going to... If you just got your testosterone checked and... He says his vitamin K is good. Well, dang. <laughs> Trying to think of other big reasons... For suppressed um, testosterone. Anders, how is your sleep? And insulin. And how is your insulin? Sleeps like a rock. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he feels good. He says has he, he feels good. Has he tried Clomid or? HCGs, and he tried any of those to try to get his own testicular production up there? Anders, have you tried any of them? Dangerous stuff, he says. Well, but it would give you answers. That would give you answers. If you did a trial of Clomid and your own testosterone production did not go up, then you know you've got, right, your, your, your latex cells are not making testosterone. But if you do Clomid and your testosterone does go up, it's a lot more encouraging that you have the ability still. Mm. So you don't have to do it long-term. We just use it as a trial to see if your Leydig cells are actually um, yeah. able to produce testosterone anymore. So you can, uh, use, you can use it short-term yeah. for diagnostic purposes. That makes sense to me. He says MK2866 works some. I'm not sure what that is. Do you know? I don't know what that is either. Let me Google it quick. <laughs> Let's Wikipedia that. <laughs> Osterine. Osterine. Um, it's a selective androgen receptor module. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Okay. And he said that works somewhat. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that doesn't really answer anything about why the testosterone is low, right? So his, his testosterone is low and he compensates for that by using a selective androgen receptor agonist. Right. It's just replacing, that's not doing anything to the testosterone or providing any answers to why it's low. Um, okay, so we got triclomid and see if it goes up. Is a test worth doing? Uh, as a short-term trial to, to gain answers. Um, and if it does, it's more encouraging. It means that your cells are still like, have yeah. it in them. Um, you know, I kind of wonder, Andrew says, have you, had you done testosterone uh, tests before that were higher? Or do we have any reason to think that they've always been this low? I mean, I, I'm, I am a little bit curious if uh, I know there's health risks of having low testosterone, but mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be normal variations that um, I don't know. Some uh, it would be interesting to know if this was age related or if, or if he had low baseline. So it'd be three forty before you went on TRT. I'm assuming that's his total, of course. Yeah, it well, must be, but yeah. he's but now his total is forty five. Is that right? Oh, I thought it was one forty five. Oh, is it? no, no, no. It's a hundred in the in the morning and forty five in the night. Yikes! So he had he had a lot higher mm -hmm. uh, before he went on TRT. So it looks like he's got long term suppression, <laughs> or you know that was ten years ago. So or it's he's fifty five now. He was forty five before, so that might be significant too. Yeah. Um. Any history of steroid use? And has you used other, other steroids? Opioids. Or opioids? I'm seeing that more and more. No, no to okay. both. Okay. Do um, you have any thoughts on his actual question, which is how long should he wait it out before going, giving up and going back? Oh, don't wait. I would go get a Clomid challenge now. <laughs> mm. And I, because then I would see if the testicular cells are functioning or not. 
Yeah. I mean, if the question is how long should you wait, um, you pro- waiting is probably not going to give you any more answers than it was giving you for the last five years. Right. And waiting probably isn't going to raise your testosterone. I mean, if you have one measurement, that it's 100 in the morning and 45 in the night, you don't really know if it's increasing. Like maybe six months ago, it was 50. So yeah. if you wanted to wait, what I would do is do some follow-up uh, testing to see if there's a, if it's actually changing over time. But I mean, if it's been flattened out for five years, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, but if it's been going up uh, 10 nanograms per milliliter, nanograms per deciliter every three yeah. months for the last five years, then, then you probably could wait it out. But without knowing that, um, there's no data indicating that waiting is a, is a good strategy here. It sounds like so. I would agree. All right. Thank you, Anders. Um, let me copy this. Sorry. Oh, I, I have it already. Okay. Um, Lee W says, any suggestions on supplements to assist with delayed onset muscle soreness? I've tried L-glutamine and haven't noticed much improvement. Um, I'll jump in here and you can add if, I mean, I don't have much to say, um, but my thoughts are, uh, I mean, my thoughts are usually, usually Dom's is a, a recovery issue and, um, I don't know, it, like maybe acid buffering, like um, beta alanine or bicarbonate, but probably, probably just uh, get used to your exercise and, and rest more, unless it's a unusually repeating thing. I don't know. What do you think, Carrie? D- that's definitely not my area of expertise. Yeah. So, uh, I'll tell you what, Lee. Come back on May twenty fifth. Saturday when we have ask us anything about sports nutrition, where I have some three guys who are better than me at sports nutrition. And that'll be, (laughs) that'll be the time to answer that. All right. Yes. Thank you for your question. Lee. Anita Morgan says, how does the body make hormones and what nutrients and foods does it need to do this? That's uh, such a good question. That's a, I think that's a very general question. Do you want to feel that or do, should we, uh, well, so I so um, we got asked this question in, in the lab because um, a, a doctor was fighting with one of my doctors as to what nutrient raises estrogen, and um, the doctor was was just new. She was new to hormones, and um, she'd been in a different field of medicine. And she was like, "Well, what hormone can I, or what nutrient can I give to raise estrogen?" And it made me realize just how much uh, people don't realize how female hormones are made since she's female. I'll start with female. Okay. So, um, and, and most of the time when people say how are hormones made, they think they're thinking estrogen and progesterone when I get asked mm. that question, yeah. right? From a woman. So women, ladies, you have two ovaries. You should have two ovaries. You're born with two ovaries in theory, and they're surrounded by follicles. And on the follicles are cells and inside the follicle is the egg that's going to eventually pop out. So you have initially the start of your month, you have two types of cells. You have what's called theca cells and that makes your testosterone and you have your granulosa cells and that's what makes your, your estradiol, your E2 right there in your ovary. So your testosterone actually aromatizes into your estrogen and your granulosa cells. And then you ovulate. So once you kick out an egg, the granulosa and the theca cells turn into lutein cells or your corpus luteum. It's the luteal phase of your, of your cycle, the second half. And those cells make progesterone and, and your progesterone goes up. And then if you're not pregnant, your progesterone comes down. If, you, if you're pregnant, then um, your progesterone stays up until your plus, and then gradually starts to come down and your placenta makes progesterone and takes over. So, um, but hormones first and foremost, as Chris said earlier, come, those hormones come from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the backbone to all of your hormones. They're, they're called your steroid hormones. And cholesterol is, is pulled into the cell and then um, it's pulled into the mitochondria and it goes through a series of steps to eventually make the hormone that you're looking for. Um, testosterone, which I mentioned, estrogen, and then of course it makes uh, progesterone. And so that's how it's made in a cycling woman. So then I get asked, well, where's, where are the rest of it? is the rest of it made. So testosterone is also made ladies in your adrenal glands. You make about 25 ish percent in your adrenal glands. Um, and there, you do make some in your fat tissue as well from another hormone called androstenedione. 
Um, and then as you go through menopause um, and now your ovaries, the follicles in your ovaries are gone, you, the ovaries are closed for business, then you make the most of your estrogen out of your fat tissue. Uh, ladies, you can take your testosterone made from your adrenal glands and your fat tissue and convert it into what's called estrone or E1. And then E1 can become the potent uh, E2 version. So you still make, you still eke out a little estrogen and, and menopause. And then progesterone is actually um, sort of made out of the adrenal glands. We hardly make any progesterone, like, like near zero as we go in, in, in menopause. Um, but the adrenal glands will uh, release some progesterone um, when it's making like cortisol or, you know, some, some of the other hormones, um, in menopause, but it's, it's like micro tiny amounts. So that's ladies, how you make estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, which is usually what people are asking when they say, how do, how do I make it? Where's it made from? Now, as far as nutrients go, um, like I said, it, cholesterol is the backbone to all of your hormones, so much like the gentleman who said earlier his cholesterol was quite low, it can impact the way and the amount of hormones that you make. The lower your cholesterol is, the tougher time you can have to make hormones. But um, the more cholesterol you make doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have mass amounts of hormones. It's a very tightly controlled system. Um, but as far as like nutrients go, really, it's it's a signaling that we're working with. It's, nutrients are helpful, but like it's not like we say like, oh, this nutrient makes estrogen. There's no nutrient that I can, you can give to, to create estrogen. But what we can do is we can help the brain communicate with the ovary and we, to, to, make, to get the estrogen production happening. We can do all the cellular health, like the healthy fats and you know, the fish oils and, and uh, you know, choline and things that make your, um, the, your uh, cell membranes really healthy. And so that they can, like, so they can make hormone, and hormone can, you know, come out into your system. And on top of that, your hormones are transported through your blood. So if you are a smoker, if you have diabetes, if you just, if you are not very active, you don't like to exercise, you're very stagnant, then your hormones are also going to have a tough time circulating around because it's the your your circulatory system is not very good. It's not very healthy. So you're hormone from your brain will have a tough time getting down to the hormone from your ovary or out of your ovary over to your, your skin or your heart or your lungs or wherever it needs to go. And so um, that's kind of like my quick, my quick snapshot for women. <laughs> Where are those hormones made? Now, obviously there are other hormones, thyroid hormone, cortisol, brain hormones, but usually women mean estrogen and progesterone when they're asking me that. Men are a little different. Um, so they don't have ovaries. <laughs> no, we have, uh, we have testes. Yes. Um, so I'll just throw out. So I, I have not done a comprehensive uh, deep dive into every nutrient that's needed to make hormones. But, um, but first, there was a very interesting study um, done. I think it was in the 1990s. I, I forget. But it was done in boys who are not undergoing puberty and they compared vitamin A and iron mm -hmm. to testosterone treatment and to a couple other androgen treatments. And the kids that got vitamin A and iron, were, like the vitamin A and iron was just as potent and actually acted twice as fast to induce puberty as the, as the testosterone and other androgens did. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can be pretty sure that those kids were deficient in vitamin A and iron though. And the amount that they gave wasn't, wasn't a lot. Um, but uh, hormones dip in zinc deficiency too. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I mentioned before that vitamin K can act as a signaling compound for synthesizing hormones. Um, and vitamin D and calcium can, uh, mm -hmm. can affect the signaling to produce sex hormones too. Uh, I think if we went through and looked at all of the enzymes involved, at least iron would be involved in some of, as cofactor for some of those enzymes. We would probably find other things too. I don't know what they all are off the oh, top of my sure. head. Yeah, but um, I think there's a lot of nutrients where, you know, for one, like whatever is going to work is really going to be highly dependent on what yeah. is your missing link, right? So if someone's zinc deficient, then probably if their hormones are messed up, the thing that's going to work is you're going to replace the zinc. Right. But uh, not everyone is zinc deficient. And there's a lot of people who have hormone problems that aren't fundamentally about micronutrients. 
For some people, it's they don't eat enough food. For some people, it's they don't have enough right. body fat. For some people, it's they have too much body fat. For yeah. some people, it's stress. Much food. There's stress, right. um, and 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 so many things that p- probably, if you were deficient in almost any nutrient enough, there's going to be something messed up about your hormones. Oh, completely. And so it's more of a, um, it's more of a of a in, an individual thing where you have to look for what's actually gone wrong in that person. Um, but it's not a direct. It's not like if you give this, if if you give vitamin C, you're going to create cortisol out of it, or if you. It's not. It's not how those hormones. Yeah, you're not going to create. Work. You're not going to derive. It, but, yeah, but, but it's um, very supportive. Absolutely. But you might increase the levels of something. Correct. So Correct. There is uh, the effect of vitamin C on hormones is not very well studied, but um, my example. <laughs> but there is. But there. There is a study showing. I forget the exact findings. There's a study out there showing that vitamin C supplementation increases sexual intercourse. I don't know that I would and, believe that, but okay. Well, <laughs> you realize all your listeners are going to go out and be like, "Vitamin C, please." <laughs> well, uh, you, 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 um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a statistician might question the yeah. design. I, I don't know, but um, huh? well, huh. but, but well, so so like vitamin C is needed for, um, so one of the things in the brain that controls the production of all of these hormones we've been talking about more is um, is the production of neuropeptides that have um, alpha, uh, what is it called? Alpha peptid, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's like alpha peptidyl glycine something. I don't know, but there's two okay. enzymes that are dependent okay. on, one's dependent on vitamin C and copper and the other is structurally dependent on zinc. Um, the vitamin C and copper are redox cofactors, and they're needed to activate half of the neuropeptides. And among the neuropeptides that are activated are all of the hypothalamic releasing hormones. So um, we usually call them hormones, but those are neuropeptides. And um, so if you didn't have enough vitamin C and cop- or copper uh, in, in that, you know, to make the neuropeptides, that could be a reason why you'd have low um, TRH or GNRH mm-hmm. um, or any of the releasing hormones. And so your thyroid hormones, your sex hormones, and your adrenal hormones could all wind up getting tanked because of that. And so I guess the question is how deficient do you need to be right. for those? Um, also oxytocin, which is needed for um, the... Uh, you know, pair bonding hormone. response to <laughs> physical intimacy mm-hmm. um, is is one of those neuropeptides that needs to be activated in that way. Um, so it's a reasonable hypothesis that vitamin C status could impact the production of thyroid hormones, sex hormones, and adrenal hormones. Um, and so maybe that yeah, an oxytocin come on that can play a role in. How often you have sex with your spouse? Come on. Yeah, um, oh, for sure. All or the, how yeah. long, or yep. how long you hug afterwards and cuddle? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, uh, but oxytocin does. Yeah. So I, but you know, uh, but it still comes back to the thing. Like, uh, I, I feel like biological complexity is sort of like an onion. You know, you can talk about one thing like that, but then you peel back that layer and you say, well, okay, how, like, how does the copper and vitamin C get into the brain? Or like what made the enzyme that used the vitamin C and copper to do that? You just start tracing back the layer and the layer. Eventually you're going to see that all of the vitamins, all of the minerals, the fat, the protein, and the carbohydrate, and how much you ate are all going to be things that can influence the hormone levels. And right, so yeah. it's sort of- How you an, digest. An answer that that's, that is that- a, a question that is that general is it potentially has an answer that just says everything. Yeah. Um, and then, and then it Period. becomes, and then, right. And then the only way to make that more specific is to start narrow, narrowing down the case by saying, okay, in, the, in this person who has this context with this specific problem. And then right. at that point you might be able to say, well, it's probably a nutrient. It's probably not a nutrient. Mm-hmm. It's probably sleep. It's probably stress. It's probably whatever it might be. Um, 
So a very general question can get a very general you answer. You get a very wide, yeah. varied answer. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your question, Anita. Um, let's see. Anonymous says, why is early morning waking a characteristic symptom of depression? And what other conditions and balances of early waking as a symptom? I know this answer. Oh. Cool. Do you know the answer? I do, well, I might, but let me, uh, you I'm, hear I'm not going to guess your answer. I want to hear your answer. <laughs> um, so, um, when you have, so the, the early morning waking, when you wake up in the morning, let me just start there. It's called the cortisol awakening response. We shorten it to the car cortisol awakening response. And it's a non, it's historically a non-stress driven natural rise in cortisol. Um, researchers aren't hundred percent sure other than maybe for survival. So when you wake up in the morning, you want to be alert, you need to be conscious, you need to be ready to go just in case there's, you know, bad things around you that, and you've, and you've been asleep, but we do know the cortisol awakening response. It happens in about the thir first 30 to 60 minutes of your day. Literally from the time your eyes open, your cortisol should shoot up to a point and then gradually come down for the rest of the day. Now with depression, so I, it's, heavily studied if you have an elevated or excessive cortisol awakening response, meaning you go higher, you, your spike is higher and more dramatic than the average bear, then your risk for morning depression is much higher. And the reason for that is we've already touched upon with um, estrogen and the serotonin versus kynearning pathway because high excessive glucocorticoids or cortisol can also upregulate the pathway away from serotonin and down towards kynurenine. And so if you wake up with excessive amounts of cortisol, for whatever reason, you're stressed out, you're anticipating your day, you wake up in pain, you wake up with inflammation, you, you know, something startled you awake, like your, your kid is throwing up. Um, it can, it can increase your risk for morning depression because it pushes that all that excessive cortisol pushes your tryptophan away from serotonin and down towards Kynearning. And then as Chris said, if you are going down the kynearning pathway and you already have issues with that, you can make that, that quinolinate, which is a, which is a neurotoxin as well. So now you have less serotonin, a more quinolinic acid, which is neurotoxin. And now you've got potentially this double whammy, if not a single whammy um, against you. So that's one of the big, when they do the research on dep morning depression, it's one of the big things they're studying is the, it's the, excessiveness of your cortisol awakening response in the morning. Are you a hyper person? Are you normal or are you flatlined? Do you go down? And then if you go down, that's a whole different thing that does all sorts of other stuff. Mm. Were you going to say something different? No, I, I didn't know that. Um, oh. <laughs> and I, and I, and I probably, I would just throw, I mean, I'll throw out a couple other yeah. things that I think could theoretically uh, be an issue. So, um, so, I mean, in addition to the glucocorticoids uh, influencing where tryptophan goes, um, I have a I have a sneaking suspicion, and I don't I don't have good data supporting this, but it just makes sense to me, and it seems to make sense with some people's anecdotal stories. Um, I think that part of the so the the, the half life of melatonin is really short, mm -hmm. and um, you have to, you have to produce it all night long, basically. Um, and I think that. And you mean pineal, right? Not gut. In yeah. this context, you're talking. Yeah, yeah, pineal. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, it can definitely be a, a limiting factor in onset insomnia, not to have enough melatonin. And one of the things that can limit that is getting tryptophan into the brain and tryptophan gets into the brain mainly as a result of the ratio between tryptophan and competing amino acids in the blood. And the best ways to increase that are to either take tryptophan in an empty stomach or to eat a high uh, meal with high glycemic carbs or to exercise. And um, my, you know, if, if not having enough tryptophan entry into the brain can be a limiting factor for for onset insomnia, it just seems logical to me that if you didn't get enough tryptophan into the brain to make enough um, melatonin precursor to keep synthesizing melatonin through the night for eight hours, basically, 
that it could also be a factor in how long you stay asleep. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, um, you know, and I, and I think this is true for some people because I know people that can't sleep through the night unless they take 10 milligrams of melatonin before mm-hmm. they go to bed. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so clearly they're, and what makes them fall asleep if they do wake up and they don't take the melatonin is eating, especially carbs, especially carbs. Yeah. Right. And so, and so that lines up very nicely with, um, they're getting, uh, they're getting, uh, melatonin precursor stored in their brain, but just maybe only four hours worth. Mm-hmm. And then they need to get another four hour dose of it. Whereas um, if they take 10 milligrams of melatonin, then the, the, uh, for, for some reason, the absorption from the gut slows a lot when you have a higher dose. I guess it must, the absorption must be saturated or something because the curve in the blood, um, like the ha- like the half life in the blood just, gets, um, I don't know if it's the half-life of the individual molecule, but like the, um, if you take a really large dose of melatonin, you can stretch out the peak curve and how long Uh, it lasts, like across the whole night, basically, even if it's not time release. And so, um, yeah, I think that, I think that lines up there. I also think that there are some people particularly people who do a lot of high intensity exercise and don't eat enough carbohydrate who are not repleting their hepatic glycogen Mm -hmm. before they go to bed. And so your, your liver has generally stored about 90 grams of, of glycogen to, for the purpose of maintaining your blood sugar between meals, the longest time that you ever go without a meal is overnight. And so that's when your liver has the biggest task ahead of it. It has even more of a task if you're practicing any kind of time-restricted feeding. Right. Quite often, people who are practicing time-restricted feeding are also practicing high-intensity exercise and are also practicing carbohydrate restriction. And so, you know, you might have a CrossFitter who eats 60 grams of carbs a day, um, is deliberately winding back the length of their evening meal to 4 p.m., and they don't know why they're waking up at 3 a.m. with their heart pounding every mm-hmm. day. And I think that's because they like, are getting an adrenaline and, and cortisol response. And they're to, irritable. <laughs> yeah. Irritable. They're always angry they're and irritable, irritable and yeah. snippy. <laughs> and so I think that can be a, a big issue for people who are early awakening as well. And if you think of both of those conditions, um, if you're not eating enough carbohydrate to, to, um, to keep your liver glycogen full, um, you're not, you're probably not getting enough to get tryptophan into your brain. And if you're not getting enough tryptophan in your brain to make melatonin all night, you're probably not getting enough tryptophan in your brain to make serotonin either. So all of those could, could kind of feed into the same mechanism that you were describing with the glucocorticoid suppression of, uh, serotonin levels. Um, so I think that's a couple more things that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Cool. Thank you for your question, anonymous. Um, and I have Next, to say hi to my friend yeah, but, Mo really quickly. He pop, popped up on the, oh, in the is chat. Mo in so. here? Hi, Mo. Mo. Mo popped up in the chat. Did Mo yeah. ask a question in the chat? She just said hi, Carrie. Oh, okay. <laughs> we used to work friends. I used to work cool, together. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, okay. Lee, uh, Lee W., who um, had the sports question, Lee W. also asks, I'm 42 and I've had one ovary removed. My hormones are in the trash. My doc has recommended starting progesterone 100 milligrams and we bumped up the estrogen gel to 0.5 milligrams my hot flashes during the day have improved but i'm sleeping terribly i wake up between 2 to 3 a.m every night sometimes i still sweat at night should i consider increasing either hormone what 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 was the route of of uh progesterone was it topical or oral progesterone 100 uh, oral it's I'm sure it's oral. Yeah, that's okay. usually starting. Okay. So, um, well, the good thing is we just answered that entire question about sleep. So take <laughs> everything that we said and apply that. Um, but on top of it, it often means um, uh, you may actually need more progesterone. Uh, like I was saying in the very beginning of this, that progesterone actually turns into that neurosteroid, um, allopregnanolone, which can cross the blood-brain barrier and bind itself to GABA and affect sleep. Um, it's very calming, you know, obviously relaxing. It's, it's GABA. So oftentimes a hundred milligrams. Now here's the, here's the kicker too. It depends what your hundred milligram oral 
cap bless you capsule is um so prometrium which is the prescription uh medication if you read the package insert prometrium actually says in there that has it has about a 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent absorption rate which means of the 100 milligrams um depending on how well your microbiome and everything your stomach acid is you're looking at 10 to 20 milligrams of progesterone out of that prometrium. There's a lot of binder and filler in prometrium. There's peanut oil in prometrium. And so um, it can it can get in the way. So I do, I have found in over the years of practice that if you have prescription prometrium, you may need to go higher. You may need to do the the 200 milligram dose. Um, you can also have it compounded though. Um, and then that way they don't have all the extra binders and the crazy grip binders and fillers and the peanut oil, they take all that out and they just put you know, it's called oral micronized progesterone, OMP. And then you can, you can then compound it to any dose you want. So you could do 150, you know, milligrams, 125, 175, 200, whatever. But usually it's the progesterone that has um, the bigger effect on sleep as compared to estrogen, although estrogen is important. Um, But I usually start with progesterone before I raise the estrogen and usually find good results. All right. Thanks, Karen. Now, obviously, Thanks. there's other things that affect sleep too, right? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, no, but sorry. you know, if you're like, if your norepinephrine's going up at night, if you're got, if your blood sugar issues, if your cortisol's going up at night, and, and norepinephrine's a big trigger for um, hot flashes for, for, for women, especially night sweats. It's a, it's, it's one of its, um, it's one of its symptoms. Women think it's hot flashes, night sweats from hormones, and really, it's from norepinephrine. So getting stress under control, you know, winding down at night, those things would, if you're on any kind of adrenal support, nourishing adrenal as opposed to stimulating adrenal can be really helpful also. Lee adds, yes, I'm on Prometrium. Also, I'm one of those folks who's working out hard, practicing time-restricted eating and lower the carbs. <laughs> I'll let him fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. So just rewind it about... 10 minutes and watch, <laughs> right. watch from there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Lee. Um, Anonymous says causes for night sweats in men. Any thoughts on that? Ooh. Um, well, I was, it's, uh, it can be hormonal just like it can be for women. So I test all the same hormones in men. I check their thyroid with night sweats. I definitely even check same thing. I check cortisol and uh, I do norepinephrine markers with night sweats. And, and this is, this is also assuming, um, that I don't suspect cancer because night sweats is off. It can be a keynote, especially in men. Um, night sweats can be a keynote for for cancers, and so I want to make sure I'm not suspicious of that. But it's the same for women: blood sugar issues, hormone issues, cortisol issues, um, and making sure you're not sleeping in an extra hot room, um, which because men can get hot their night sweats from being overheated, just like women can. You know, sort of those basic things too. I just got a chili pad. I've been thinking. Ooh, I've about, been wanting to try one. What thinking, do you think? I've been thinking about a, getting a chili pad for years. Yeah. And um, I went to a little conference where the guy who invented the chili pad was there, and he let me borrow one for the night. And uh, you and I bought the chili pad. Um, <laughs> in fact, I if I were any of you, I would not buy the chili pad. I would pre-order the Uller, which is their new model that's shipping in June. And, um, but I wanted it so badly that I bought the chili pad with the intention to buy the new model when it, when it comes out in June. Um, but in the new model, you're the, you're going to be able to control from the app. Like it's, it's at least hour by hour. It might be minute by minute when you want the temperature to go up and down. And there's a, there's a warm to wake function. Uh, so it just gradually increases in warmth by, you know, leading up to when you want to wake up, which ties in nicely with the data from a few years ago showing that in hunter gatherers who sleep outside, they wake up before the sunrise with the um, with the increase in core temperature being, which is driven by the increase in ambient temperature as you near the sunrise. That is the key trigger for the waking. Um, so that's a, a natural function in it. And also, there, I think there's a lot of people who, who sleep much better at a temperature that is colder than the, than the temperature that they fall asleep at. I totally um, agree. And, and so you can't currently, um, you can't, you can't currently make the timing function with the current model of the chili pad, but with the one that's coming out in June, you will be able to, and you'll be able to set it so that it goes to maybe like 65 
or whatever feels comfortable to you while you're uh, actually you can warm it to 110 um wow. so uh it's, yeah so like uh wow. you could have it you know if 75 is comfortable to you when you're falling asleep and you can have it so that 20 minutes later it goes down to 55 which is not the temperature that it feels like the room is it's the temperature of the water circulating in it so i like i if ambient temperature like 64 is my best temperature to sleep at but i keep the chili pad at 55 because mm-hmm. it um that sort of like, but what I noticed was I will usually have complete insomnia at anything above 72 ish. Mm-hmm. I'll have great difficulty at 70 and 72, 74 is the threshold where I just will not fall asleep. Right. And um, I can have my room as hot as 80 if, and sleep well On if the chili, the chili pad. pad is set at 55. Um, and so I'm really excited about that for the summer because I think that it, it's much less stress on the air quality to not have to run the air conditioner as much. Mm-hmm. And also um, the way my room is set up, it's really hard to uh, to not to have the AC on and not having it blow on me while I'm in mm-hmm. bed. Um, so I think it's it. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm just super excited about it. And I wrote it down. Gotta it, throw it out there okay. if you're if you're gonna bring up. Uh, the room temperature for the night sweats. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Anonymous. Uh, Min, let's, uh, yeah. Mindy Cabrera says, dietary nutritional advice for breast cancer prevention, macronutrient ratios, micronutrient intakes, et cetera. Also, any thoughts on risks and benefits of HRT and pre- perimenopause relative to breast cancer risk? My mother died of metastatic lobular breast cancer, mm-hmm. but she used Premarin. According to 23 and you have the gene associated with lower levels of SHBG. So did she. So I think I need to be more cautious with exogenous estrogen. Any thoughts, Carrie? Would you read, what was the first part again? First Dietary? First part is uh, macronutrient ratios and micronutrient intakes for breast cancer prevention. Um, well, that's probably better for you when it comes to like nutrient okay. ratios and stuff. But I will say working for an estrogen lab where we're looking at phase one and phase two, detoxification and what we're, what we're trying to assess with, um, estrogen. So when men and women, we, we make estrogen and then we have, we detox our estrogen, right? And so we go through phase one detoxification when, and that becomes, um, uh, um, well, it becomes a reactive oxygen species essentially. And then we, and then we quickly neutralize it. Our, our body has these systems in place to protect us. But if one of your pathways for phase one does not get neutralized, that it turns tail and it goes down, I call the naughty pathway. Technically it's called the quinone pathway, which starts with the Q. Um, And so to, and then that pathway continues on. It can lead to DNA damage. There are these things that are created. So the naughty pathway is a bad one? It is. Yeah. Imagine that. Quinone with Q. Um, and so they form addicts um, in, in addicts, A-D-D-U-C-T, addicts, uh, when they're unstable, they bind to the DNA and then break off. And so now your DNA goes, oh my gosh, there's holes in my DNA. I have to repair them. The more holes you have, the more higher chance you get for mutation. Now, estrogen is not the only thing that can do this. Um, you know, environmental toxicity, toxicants, you know, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, other things can form addicts that cause holes in the DNA. So from a nutritional standpoint, when we're looking at before and after testing, um, you know, this is when we, we get into things like your brassica family, your broccoli, your kale, your cauliflower. Um, this is when we get into things like your broccoli sprouts um, because those, those broccoli sprouts, when you chew them or if you cut them up and, and let them sit on your cutting board for a couple minutes, you activate uh, two ingredients to become something called sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is really important and helpful at stopping your estrogen from going down the naughty quinone pathway and pushing it back to the beginning again. Plus it also helps support um, your phase two detoxification and upregulates that. Um, some other super helpful things besides besides that are um, foods high in resveratrol, um, your, your, your flavonoids, um, uh, is, your, is the phase two for that one methylation? Yes. Yep. So phase two, COMPT, C-O-M-T is your, yeah. is your big one there. So um, folate and B12 and... Actually, the uh, two big choline. cofactors are SAMe and uh, magnesium for, for COMPT, but obviously B12, oh, right, but, folate, 
or helps your for the Sammy, whole cycle. Yeah, maintaining maintaining your Sammy levels is going to be is going to be driven by the methyl donors and so oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All fully choline. But what every, as you know, I mean, I'm sure as you get this, is everyone goes, oh, methylation, it's MTHFR. I have that. I'm like, well, it's, it's much bigger. It's more, it's a little bit bigger than that when it comes to estrogen and, and well, everything, but your COMT creation and then what it does for estrogen. And so when it comes to breast cancer, I'm trying to get women to go get off the quinone pathway or repair the quinone pathway, have proper phase one, proper phase two, and then phase three is through the intestines. So now I'm looking at, you know, microbiome support, making sure she's not constipated, making sure, you know, she's got fiber and prebiotics and, and probiotics and just to get the estrogen from start to finish. And so it doesn't recirculate and uh, increase, increase in that regard. And that's just focusing on estrogen that is that, that obviously there's a whole lot when it comes to antioxidant support and and everything else yeah there's some data that vitamin d and calcium uh lower the risk of estrogen responsive breast cancer but only up to the point of um only up to the point of levels that would help your bone health. So basically you don't want to be deficient in those nutrients, but mega dosing them is not going to be relevant. Um, yeah. So I, but I think, I think that um, g- given the relevance of CMMT, I would direct people to the methylation page that I have at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash methylation. Um, your, I mean, maintaining your SAMI levels is going to be dependent on the methyl donors, full AB12, choline, but also um, magnesium and, and ATP. So in theory, um, you could have low ATP levels compromising that that would be, um, that could be related to low energy intake or could be related to taking something that lowers ATP like berberine or metformin or could be related to metabolic problems from insulin or thyroid. Um, and the Dutch test has uh, tells you how much you're methylating that, right? It does for estrogen. Yeah, estrogen, estrogen is the one yeah. thing we look at for methylation. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Okay, and then for this I'm, second I'm, part of her no. question, I have been actually referring people to um, Dr. Peter Atia, which I know you've been on his podcast. Um, he did a different podcast with um, mm, um, yeah. Avram Blooming and uh, Carol. Um, oh, this is embarrassing. I even have their book. But it's a great one on SHRT, um, and they have a, a book out, Estrogen Matters, and I just got mine from Amazon yesterday. So um, I, if you are concerned about your for the pros and cons of HRT, especially in reference to um, breast cancer, I would highly recommend watching it's, or listening. Uh, Avram Blooming and yep. Carol uh, Tavris. That's what it is. Thank you. Um, but read the book, Estrogen Matters. Listen to the podcast. Um, it's really helpful. They present the data in a very um, able to easy un- to understand way. You don't, did, you don't did have your, to be a you, did your viewpoint on estrogen change from reading that book? Not because of them. Um, I was never. I was never against estrogen. Um, I was always the one of the doctors trying to say that estrogen should not be vilified. It's again, mm. it's Goldilocks. It's, it's very vilified in a right? lot of the but, alternative health. I mean, uh, oh my gosh! Areas. I mean, just look on social media. I mean, there are entire pages dedicated to you know getting rid of estrogen, blocking estrogen. And I can, I can understand if you have severe endometriosis, if you, you know, if like the estrogen has sort of wrecked your life, I understand that. But what, 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 um, I have been wanting to do is like, well, but we need it ladies. Like we need it. It is important for our brain health, like critical to our brain health. It can help prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. It helps. It's critical to our bone development. It's critical for our skin. It's critical for our immune system. And if we just do everything in our power to suppress it, um, you, the, the trade-off is we know, I mean, but maybe we have dementia and Alzheimer's, so we don't, we don't know. We don't care, but I, I care. So I want 
healthy bones and healthy brain and healthy immune system and all these things. So I've always been an advocate for estrogen. And um, there was a compounding pharmacy a couple of years ago where they were presenting some of the data about estrogen and how it's been vilified. And I was so excited. And then when I heard uh, Peter's podcast with them, um, I was even more excited. And I have not read the book. I've just okay. heard the podcast. Yeah, I haven't. I've only got it yesterday. Too. So it's it's sitting right next to my bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cool. Ready to read. Did it change yours? Did it change your thoughts well, on estrogen? I also didn't read the book. I listened to the podcast. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. I've been exposed to a lot of anti-estrogen mm-hmm. stuff too. Um, my, my, Actually, my view on estrogen was evolving um, earlier than I heard that podcast over the last year, actually, because... I'm reading the book, The Female Brain, which is actually yeah. kind of oldish book, but um, the, but uh, the, I mean, it's, it comes across as um, estrogen comes across as as very important for like mood and things like that in that book, and and so that was part of it. Um, I, you know, I was. I had a friend who, and we talked about this a little bit. I had a friend who was struggling with um, with water retention around her period, and I was I was uh, I, I had been very um, exposed to a lot of stuff about progesterone being the good hormone and estrogen being the bad hormone. Oh yeah, and I no. looked at a really good paper that showed that in women who had water retention symptoms with PMS, their the main difference in their hormones was that they weren't clearing progesterone as fast mm-hmm. from their ovulation related peak. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was discussing this with a different friend who had found that she would consistently get water retention in response to using progesterone creams. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there were a couple things that were kind of all... Um, making me a little more pro estrogen than I had been in the past, like leading (laughs) up to listening to that podcast. I'm still left a little confused though. If, if estrogen is protective against age related dementia, why does most Alzheimer's happen in women? Like the one, the the three big risk factors. Isn't it because we're like a big reason, right? That we've, we are protected up to the point and then we go through menopause and we lose all that estrogen. So, a man's yeah, production of estrogen and a postmenopausal woman's production of estrogen. I mean, it's really interesting to look at. Oh, I, I wonder if... Um, I, I'm, I'm so uneducated about this that I don't know if my speculation does more good than harm, but um, I wonder if it's related to the change in hormones because... Um, so the female brain talks a lot about estrogen's influence on just modifying the synaptic density of various parts of the brain and, and, um, and that changing in after menopause. Um, but I, you know, I, like maybe men are protected because they don't, they aren't placed with the demand of completely rewiring their brain after they've set it up for 50 years. Right, right. Because men go through puberty and while there are changes and declines, women go through puberty and then, you know, often there's pregnancies. So it's all these spikes. And then we go through reverse puberty when we go through perimenopause into menopause. And um, cognitive symptoms are so big so common for my perimenopausal women who say, I used to remember everything and I, now I can't remember anything. I have to write lists. I feel like I have dementia. I have incredible brain fog. I read something and I can't remember it. I can't listen to podcasts anymore because I don't remember what they're saying or I can't really comprehend it. Um, I, I get this all the time from women is they hit their 40s and into their 50s as their estrogen is going up and down. But eventually, of course, declines with menopause. So, um, and it's usually, it's, it's not often, at least with my patient population, a gradual thing. It's not like 
for the last, you know, 15 years, you know, women will say, I'm having to write lists more and more. It's usually what the heck for my 45th birthday, I can't Mm. sleep and I can't remember anything. I'm like, and I gained 15 pounds. I'm like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) whoever designed menopause can suck it. (laughs) It's so not fair. And, you know, if you, I mean, biology, biologically, we live a really long time and we weren't designed to. So women, we had all this estrogen up to a point and, um, and, and then we don't, and then we go into menopause and we have very little levels, very low levels. In fact, a a man's, um, estrogen and a woman, a postmenopausal woman's estrogen are about on par. If you look at the reference ranges, and, but he doesn't go through all the like up down stuff and he doesn't have high levels, you know, through a lot of his cycle and he doesn't get pregnant. And so he doesn't have all this like excessive normal estrogen stuff thrown his way and thrown his brain's way. And then it all gets taken away. I mean, it's like yeah. gone. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. have it. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah. we, have, we have 20 minutes left. Um, so let's cut off new questions and then we'll try to uh, hit, talk faster. Chip away, chip, chip away <laughs> at uh, what, what we can here. So right. Jennifer Dunlop says, "Getting in late, maybe past the time for questions." I was wondering if there are. Well, uh, here you go, Jennifer. Uh, getting in. I was wondering if there are hormonal phenotypes that would predict whether a woman will have a cycle without ovulating, or simply lose her cycle altogether than under stress. Does it relate to body fat? So, why would a woman have? No cycle, why would one have an anovulatory cycle? So remember, cortisol is very, very, very um, uh, potent in the brain. And so if the body perceives itself as under stress, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, environmental, it doesn't matter, then reproduction is not its primary focus anymore. Um, is and, and I heard this, I had been thinking this for a long time. I didn't know how to eloquently say it. And then Dr. Felice Gersh said it on stage one day. She said, ladies, whether you want to or not, like, I'm sorry, but you were put here to, to reproduce. Biology is what you do. Now, obviously not all women do. And a lot of women, in fact, are trying to avoid it, but that's what the body is set up for. Yeah. So when you are under a lot of stress and under body fat, under body weight um, falls in that category, then you, your brain says, this is a stressor. This is not a good time to get pregnant. I'm going to take away her ovulation and, or I'm going to make her cycle late and, or I'm going to take her cycle away completely altogether. And so I, we hear that a lot with women who have gone through a lot of stress, job change, divorce, death. Um, sometimes it can even be like just uh, flying time zone changes can be a huge one for changing your cycle. But definitely when you're under body weight, you don't make the hormone leptin like you should. And leptin is a big um, hormone for letting the brain know she's of a normal weight. She can carry a baby safely and he- in a healthy manner. So go ahead and make her ovulate. So if you are underweight, um, then oftentimes the body says, nope, not healthy, not strong enough, not able enough. Let's protect her, take away ovulation and or take away the cycle completely. And then when the body fat comes back up, you see this all the time in like gymnasts or my CrossFitters who stop CrossFit or my chronic marathon runners, you know, they'll stop it. And um, the stress goes down, the weight goes up to a, a more perceived healthy weight by the brain. And then they can ovulate and have a period. Regardless of having a baby is your end goal. It doesn't matter. Um, but that's how the brain works. Yeah. My, my uh, model for understanding this is, uh, is pretty similar. So I, I feel like um, fertility is largely regulated by the question of, can I afford energetically to invest in the, you know, 50,000 calories and making a baby a commitment of one or 2000 calories a day in lactation and, um, and then, and then on the long term scale, um, you know, we invest a lot in the success. We're not E. coli. We don't just like make a billion babies and see which one survives. We make a huge energetic investment, uh, collectively in children. And so, um, if your stress hormones are high, that's saying, 
well, whatever we do have for energy, we might have these more important things that are come first that we have to deal with before we can make that investment. If we don't have enough energy, then um, it says the same thing on the, on the opposite side of that equation, that we don't have enough energy to deal with whatever um, we might face right now or in the long term. And I think I've seen some, I've seen a, uh, a couple papers connecting in ovulate and ovulatory cycles to hypothyroidism. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, um, you know, stress hormones are sort of on one side of this equation. And uh, you mentioned leptin. I would also put insulin and thyroid hormone on the other side, the, the side of um, saying we have enough energy stress mm-hmm. hormones on the side of saying we don't have enough energy, um, maybe not because of an energetic deficit, but simply because they're signaling a, you know, a stressful situation that demands energy. And, um, and I think that body fat, so being underweight is a huge, if you look at fertility rates, um, there's some, there's some observational data where they just look at under un, the BMI of male and female partners. And basically like, um, two underweight partners are, uh, going to be very infertile. But then as you cross a certain BMI threshold, you start to see infertility happen again. And I think that's largely because of resistance to insulin and leptin, right. um, you know, the energy is there, but now your defect is you're not perceiving it properly. Um, so yeah, very, uh, very similar thoughts on that. So Jennifer adds, it seems that I simply don't ovulate under stress, but others have a delayed ovulation and a longer cycle. Um, it's probably just a variation of the same response. You think? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, for your question. Anita Morgan says, what can be done to reverse hypothyroidism other than taking thyroid medicine? I've been taking desiccated thyroid, nature thyroid, and one drop of Lugol's iodine per day. My doctor is that a hair test shows iodine of 1.0. However, a drop of iodine on my skin takes a long time to absorb. Um, I'll, I'll throw in a couple things. So uh, if you just look at the nutrients needed to make thyroid hormone, you're looking at um, enough protein in addition to enough iodine. But then also the production of thyroid hormone is a very, very dirty process that requires an enormous amount of uh, antioxidant support. And so selenium is very important, but also, um, you know, if you're looking at antioxidant protection, you're looking at not just things that we think of as dietary antioxidants, but you're looking at uh, protein, zinc, iron, copper, manganese, in addition to selenium. Um, You're looking at uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, um, and a whole bunch, sort of a Pandora's box that you're opening up. So I think that probably the things that stand out the most are protein, iodine, and selenium, but really you have a pretty big network of, of supportive nutrients in the background. Um, of course, everything I just said assumes that you're missing something that you need to make thyroid hormone, which is not necessarily the case, but, um, but I covered part of it. Do you want to take yeah. from that? That was going to just say that on top of that, making sure you understand the difference between um, are you, do you like do you have cellular or peripheral hypothyroidism? So, so many things can get in the way of converting your T4 into your T3, high estrogen, high leptin, high insulin, high cortisol, low progesterone, low DHEA. And so if you have any of these things, you may be deemed hypothyroid um, but, but really it's these peripheral factors play into it as well. Okay. Thank you, Anita. Uh, let's see. Anonymous says, anonymous says a lot of things. Let's see. Let me one. <laughs> do you have any experience with iodine restriction for treating Hashimoto's? Carrie, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know. Not, not with iodine restriction for Hashimoto's. How so about you? I, well, I don't have experience with it, but I'll say that um, I read about this in Datis Karazian's book, <laughs> Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When All My Lab Tests Are Normal? And I looked at the studies that he cites and uh, I didn't think they were very convincing. So there is an argument out there that um, basically the argument is that the Hashimoto's is driven by 
uh, oxidative stress and uh, driving inflammation that is a result of not being able to protect the thyroid under the conditions that make thyroid hormone. And so if you put more iodine in there, you're going to increase thyroid hormone production. You're going to increase all of the damaging things that you're not, um, that you don't have adequate protection against. And uh, there was a, the back in the day, quite a while ago, there was a very uh, extensive back and forth debate on the perfect health diet website between a few people on this. And I agree with the conclusions that they came to, which is that you, under those conditions, you definitely want to make sure that you're not missing key things that are needed to protect the thyroid. But as long as you're adequate in those, and you know, chief among them would be selenium. But I have to add here that I really don't think anyone should supplement with more than 100 micrograms of selenium if they're not measuring their plasma selenium because you basically have a 50-50 chance of having too much or too little selenium because the soil distribution is completely random. And, um, and p- plants do not regulate how much selenium they take up, which is, d- which is different in principle than every other mineral. Like, for example, if you have a place where the soil has toxic levels of copper in it, it's going to increase on average the food copper accumulation by 25% because the, because the plants control their copper intake uh, or uptake homeostatically, whereas selenium, they don't. And if you have three times the level of selenium in the soil, you're going to have three times the level of selenium in the plants. And, um, and so I don't think it's wise for people to just throw 200 micrograms a day of selenium in because they have Hashimoto's. But um, I, I do think it makes sense to say before I'm going to supplement with iodine, uh, I'm going to make sure that I have selenium and the other things in place that I need to protect my thyroid gland during the process of making thyroid hormone. Um, and so, but I think that's the limit to iodine restriction. I don't think, I don't think, um, I don't think it makes sense to treat Hashimoto's by just completely avoiding iodine because at some point down the line you're not gonna wind, you're not gonna have any thyroid hormone if you don't have any iodine. Um, so that's my thought on that. Uh, okay. Uh, Brent, uh, no. What are the implications for hormonal balance of following a low carb or ketogenic diet? Are there concerns to watch for? Um, I'll throw a couple things out. So yeah. Uh, so first of all, if you don't have enough carbohydrate to feed your body's demand for it. So even on a ketogenic diet, your brain's consumption of glucose goes down 75%, but your brain consumes 120 grams of glucose a day, uh, when you're not on a ketogenic diet. And so your, your, your total demand for glucose is at maximum going down And what I mean, the maximum decrease in your need for carbohydrate would would be that it could go down to maybe 45 grams a day if you're on a, if you're very keto adapted. And that is, um, I don't mean, and so I'm, that's referring to the amount of carbohydrate you need to burn for energy. Um, So you can make that carbohydrate through gluconeogenesis, but one of the, um, one of the the key regulators of gluconeogenesis is cortisol. And if if cortisol doesn't normalize your blood glucose levels, you can also get adrenaline pumping in. Um, so you can you can throw things off that way. The other thing is that uh, you won't find this in any textbook on hormones, but insulin insulin acts on the thyroid gland to mimic about half of what TSH does on the molecular level. And so insulin is like, if you look at like how much TSH do you need to make the amount of thyroid hormone that you need, uh, it's contextual among your, against your insulin level. Because if you take out the insulin, then you're, you basically need more TSH to make the same amount of thyroid hormone. And if you're not ramping up the TSH, you will probably have a decline in thyroid hormone. And in fact, if you look at uh, T3 levels on low carbohydrate diets, they tend to go down. And um, some low carbohydrate diet advocates um, 
will actually like there are some people that think low T3 is good for your lifespan. Uh, who's the uh, I think Ron Rosedale was making this argument oh, that yeah. um, that you want to be on a low carbohydrate diet so that you will lower your T3 so that you will live longer. Um, so there's that. And then also elevated free fatty acids is going, that's one of the factors, and you were talking about peripheral uh, thyroid hormone metabolism. So one of the factors that determines um, the actual transport of thyroid hormone into the cell and binding to the nuclear receptor to affect gene expression is the free fatty acid level. So I think declines in, and and thyroid hormone regulates sex hormone production and, and other things. So I think that you have the potential for a decrease in thyroid hormone and sex hormones um, and an increase in cortisol. And I'm not saying that happens in everyone, but it's just one of the things that could happen. And I, I remember talk, I originally was very interested in this because I was talking to someone who was a type one diabetic and they were managing their type one diabetes by basically eating zero carb, but their testosterone and thyroid hormone levels were low. And their question was clearly, there's a cause and effect relationship there, but is it better to eat carbohydrate and take insulin or, or is it better to live with low testosterone levels? And so that that's, that, those are my thoughts. Do you have yeah. anything you want to add to that? Well, the, the one thing that I would add is because I work for a hormone lab and see thousands and thousands and thousands of them, um, the number of people that are on a uh, keto type diet and their hormones are a mess, um, is often, I, I have a lot of doctors, a lot of practitioners who are trying keto, um, uh, or, you know, something like that. And, um, they call me and they're like, I feel terrible. I, I feel like everything's a mess. We run their hormone tests and sure enough it is. And, and, and oftentimes they're like, forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to quit this. It's, and they'll go and get a blood work done for their thyroid, their thyroid's also a mess. And, um, I, I, and again, just like you said, this isn't everybody for sure. Definitely some very fat adapted people are doing great to have no issue, but the number of, uh, uh, complaining or irritated or hormonally imbalanced practitioners that I talk to who have tried, who are have been doing keto is, uh, outweighs the ones that are doing it and testing and feel really good. However, keep in mind the patient population I'm seeing are, they're calling me because something's wrong. If something's yeah, not wrong, they're, they're not going to call right, me. They have hormone problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By yeah. Um, as, yeah, a, so. as a follow-up to what I was just saying about the insulin, uh, and this, this was actually posted a while ago, not uh, in reference to me saying the same thing in a different context. Chris has talked before about the importance of insulin signaling the thyroid function. Is there an optimum number of meals per day for optimizing thyroid function, i.e. number of insulin spikes a day? I, I don't think so. Um, the, the main influences on thyroid function are going to be the total area under the curve of insulin, you know, assuming that you're controlling for the level of insulin sensitivity uh, on the thyroid gland. And then also the, um, in, so I, I guess if I had to throw out a wild guess, um, it, the free fatty acid concentration is probably mostly relevant when the when the free fatty acid levels are really high. And so it's probably not the case that you want um, to, to just like, uh, it's probably, I don't know. I, you're, if, you, if you go a long time without eating food um, or you go, or you eat like very high fat, very low carb acutely, um, that in that context is probably when the free fatty acid levels are getting the highest. Um, if you're spreading your meals out more, you're probably never going to have as big of a peak or you're spreading your carbohydrate out, out more. You're probably not going to have as you, you might have slightly elevated free fatty acids and never actually cross the threshold for that to matter. But I still think the dominant thing is on for insulin on the thyroid is mostly just going to be an average cumulative thing. So I don't think that the number of spikes is going to drive that. It's my thought. Um, I like it. Okay. I'm on 
uh, biot hormones, B I O T E. I'm not sure if that's misspelled or if that's a thing. No, that's an actual, uh, that's a prescription. Oh, okay. Um, bio T, um, you have to look them up. Bio T hormones. I think testosterone is causing acne and male pattern baldness. I've been reducing yep. testosterone at pellet insertions. DHT tests showed low levels. Am I correct, correct to keep reducing testosterone? And is it possible to avoid male pattern baldness? I'm 69 and female. Um, did she, okay, say, say it again. Her testosterone's her te- uh, She thinks testosterone's causing acne and male pattern baldness. She has been reducing testosterone at pellet insertions. DHT is low. Am I correct to keep reducing testosterone and is it possible to avoid male pattern baldness? So DHT is only one of the alpha metabolites. Um, if, if you're just doing it in serum, that's usually what everyone tests. Um, but there are some other big ones, um, androsterone or androsterone and 5-alpha uh, androsteradiol is another big one that you can test in urine testing. And so a DHT may be... Um, low in women, but I'll see the androsterone be really elevated, which is more common in women, I see. Um, And then in which case it's not necessarily, yes, you can decrease testosterone, but you need to get yourself sort of off the five alpha pathway. And so that's when you're looking at one lifestyle. So decreasing stress, looking at your insulin, but then supplemental, um, this is when you're looking at the things like soft palmetto, stinging metal root, pygium, Africanum, um, EGCG from green tea, reishi mushroom, zinc, those things help reduce the 5-alpha effect um, to reduce the male pattern baldness effect. So that's usually what I see. It's not, You can reduce the testosterone, but really it's the pathway it's going down. You're probably just missing the metabolite that's causing the problem. All right. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrie Jones, for showing up. This was really fun. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a handful of questions that we, uh, didn't get to, but for the ones that are most, uh, hormone related, uh, Carrie, where, where, where should people get in touch with you if, uh, if they want to ask you a question at some point? So they can definitely get, well, that you should follow me on social media. That's where I do everything. <laughs> so like you said in the beginning, follow me on Instagram, Jones, And uh, that's where I have tons of educational posts and respond to stuff. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie. This is really fun. Thank you everyone who showed up um, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Bye. This episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believed that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ of the individual. For example, the traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Modern science makes sense of this. Heart is uniquely rich in coenzyme Q10, which supports heart health. The importance of eating organs, though, is much broader than simply matching the organ you eat to the organ you want to nourish. For example, natives of the Arctic had very limited access to plant foods and got their vitamin C from adrenal glands. Vitamin C is important to far more parts of your body than simply your adrenals. In his epic work, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price recorded a story of natives who cured blindness using eyeballs, which are very rich in vitamin A. But now that we understand vitamin A, we know that we can get even more vitamin A by eating liver, making liver good for your eyes. Our ancestors made liberal use of organ meats both to be economical and to utilize their healing and nourishing properties. Animals in the wild do the same. Weston Price had also recorded a story of how the zoos in his era were capturing lions, tigers, and leopards, oh my, only to watch them become infertile in captivity. Researchers then observed what the lions did when they killed zebras in the wild. What they did was they went straight for the organs and bone marrow, leaving the muscle meat behind for the birds. But even the birds took what they could of the organs and bone marrow. Price reported that once the zookeepers started feeding the animals organ meats, boom, their fertility returned. The problem I often encounter, though, is that many people just don't like eating organ meats. 
Let's face it, if you weren't raised on them, it can be very hard to acquire a taste for them. That is where Ancestral comes in. Ancestral Supplements has a nose-to-tail product line of grass-fed liver, organ meats, living collagen, bone marrow, and more, all in the convenience of a gelatin capsule. For more information or to buy any of their products, go to ancestralsupplements.com. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This episode is brought to you by Ample. Ample is incredible. It's a meal in a bottle that takes a total of two minutes to prepare, consume, and clean up. Two minutes. I'm not kidding. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anything that quick just has to be made of synthetic ingredients that you'd have a hard time pronouncing and wouldn't want to put into your body. But it's not. Ample is made entirely from natural ingredients and designed to provide an optimal balance between protein, fat, and carbs, as well as all the vitamins and minerals that you'd need in a single meal. There's no question that it's always best to sit down and take your time eating a home-cooked meal from fresh ingredients. But let's face it, oftentimes we just don't have time for that. If you live a busy life like I do and your goal is to get things done, you need quality fuel that you can get into your system quickly. Here's a great example where Ample is perfect for me. When I shoot videos, it takes hours to set up and break down all of my equipment. So I try to get as many videos shot in a day as possible. This prevents wasting a lot of time on setup and helps me conserve big blocks of time outside of shooting videos to get into a flow state where I can research something to my heart's content and spend all the time I need thinking about it creatively and analytically. But if I spend hours dealing with recording equipment plus hours spent preparing food, eating it, and cleaning up, there's like no time left over to actually shoot any videos. So on recording days, I use Ample to maximize efficiency and focus on getting things done. Ample comes in three versions, original, keto, and vegan. And each version comes in two portion sizes, 400 calorie and 600 calorie. The 600 calorie original version gives me 37 grams of protein from a mix of grass-fed whey and collagen, which promotes satiety and flips my brain on. Its fat comes from coconut oil and macadamia nut oil. I like these oils because they're low in polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, oils that promote aging and are usually loaded into the processed foods that most people eat when they need something on the go. The coconut oil provides some medium chain fats to keep my energy levels up too. The carbs, the vitamins, and the minerals all come exclusively from food sources like sweet potatoes, bananas, cocoa powder, wheat, and barley grass, and chlorella. It's full of natural prebiotic fibers and probiotics to promote a healthy microbiome, and the gentle sweetness comes from a mix of honey, monk fruit, and stevia. I just mix it with water, drink it, rinse out the bottle, and boom, two minutes in, and I'm fully fueled and ready to face the next phase of the day. I first came across Ample when I met its founder and CEO, Connor Young, at PaleoFX a few years ago. Connor inspired me with his vision for Ample, which I anticipate will be much more than a meal in a bottle in the near future. I've become an official advisor to Ample, and I'll be helping Ample design scientific research that will lead both to an ever-improving Ample and, I hope, meaningful contributions to our understanding of how to use nutrition to help people be healthier and happier and perform better at the challenges that they care most about. As a listener to the Mastering Nutrition podcast, I've also worked out a special deal for you. If you use the discount code CHRIS15, you'll get 15% off your first order of Ample. To get your discount, go to amplemeal.com. That's amplemeal.com, A-M-P-L-E-M-E-A-L.com, amplemeal.com, and use the code CHRIS15 at checkout. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this. Ask us anything about hormones and found it useful. You can find more of Dr. Carrie Jones at drcarriejones.com, where doctor is just spelled D-R. And you can find her on Instagram at drcarriejones, where D-R, or excuse me, where doctor is spelled D-R, period. And I highly recommend following her on Instagram. If you would like to participate in the next Ask Us Anything or the next Ask Me Anything About Nutrition, then just join the CMJ Master Pass. You can go to chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass slash mastering nutrition. Adding that slash mastering nutrition at the end will save you a 10% lifetime discount off the cost of the program. And in this program, you don't just get access to uh, 
the schedule's not completely regular yet, but uh, generally it averages out to at least monthly. Sometimes I take a month off, sometimes we do a few in a month. But you get access to regular Ask Me Anythings or Ask Us Anythings, and you also get access to early access to my content. So if I have a bunch of Chris Master John Lights scheduled, um, and to go out or a bunch of mastering nutrition episodes scheduled to go out. You'll have early access to them as soon as they're produced. You'll also get access to transcripts of all my audio video content, which you can't get elsewhere. And you also get free access to my vitamins and minerals 101 premium uh, course, where you don't just get the lessons by email or Facebook messenger as you do in the regular vitamins and minerals 101 course, uh, but you also get all the lessons in uh, organized in a highly accessible form with downloadable PDFs, with the ability to search across all the content, uh, with the ability to click to links between sections and go exactly where you need to go and skip over all the stuff that you don't want. Um, the only other way to get access to that is uh, to pre-order the book, uh, but you get access to that automatically by virtue of being a member of the CMG Masterpass, you can also pre-order the book at big discounts if you're a member of the CMG Masterpass. You can also get massive discounts on the Chili Pad or Uller that can be up to $450 depending on which model you buy. And you can get uh, you can get big discounts on all my stuff as well, including $50 off each consultation with me. So. Um, if any of that is interesting to you, then simply uh, signing up for the Same Day Masterpass will earn you access to the Ask Me Anythings and the Ask Us Anythings with um, any and all of those other benefits that might appeal to you. So hope to see you there. You can always find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com and you can find me at chrismasterjohn on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. All right, I'll see you in the next episode.